Hello everyone. My name is Ramis Kafli, a senior solutions architect at KFW Bank with years of experience in cloud architecture and DevOps. First of all, I'd like to thank TU Berlin, Community Events Berlin and AWS for hosting this DevOps session. I am very glad to join you for this pre-recorded session. Although the session is pre-recorded, I'll be present throughout the event today, September 14th. So please feel free to approach me with any questions or discussions. Today, we'll explore how to build a fully autonomous disaster recovery pipeline for Kubernetes on AWS so that failover becomes fast, predictable, and almost entirely automated. Let me start by explaining why automation plays such an important role in disaster recovery. When outages occur, time is critical and manual actions often slow things down or introduce errors. Automation removes this uncertainty, so it accelerates the recovery process, ensures every step is performed consistently, and also reduces the stress on engineers during high pressure situations. So by automating the entire pipeline, we create a highly repeatable and reliable process that performs the same way every time, uh, even in chaotic scenarios, and hence disaster recovery automation is very, very helpful in such situations. Before designing any disaster recovery system, we must understand the two core objectives that guide everything. First, RTO, the recovery time objective, which defines how long we can afford for a system to be down after a failure. This influences how quickly we must bring infrastructure and applications back online. Secondly, RPO, the recovery point objective. It defines how much data loss is acceptable and also tells us how frequently backups must occur or how quickly data must be replicated across regions. In Kubernetes environments, these two objectives shape our backup cadence, replication strategy between clusters, and also the amount of automation required to meet business commitments. Now, let us look at multi-region strategy. First, we deploy our primary and secondary EKS clusters in two completely separate uh, AWS regions. So this protects us from region-wide outages. Second, we can perform continuous cross-region replication of Kubernetes state and application data so that the secondary cluster always has up-to-date copy. Third step then is a re disaster recovery engine, which monitors the health of the primary region and can automatically trigger failover whenever needed. Fourth, Route 53, it provides the cross-region routing capabilities and failover logic that make the traffic shift seamless for users. Finally, we ensure that all cluster components are deployed using infrastructure as code so that both regions follow the same architecture and remain perfectly aligned. Okay, now let us dive into one of the examples that we currently use for one of our Kubernetes workloads in production. This diagram shows how we run the application across two AWS regions. Region 1 on the left is our primary region and region 2 on the right is our disaster recovery region. Both regions follow the same structural pattern so that failover is smooth and predictable. In each region, we distribute our EC2 worker nodes across two availability zones. These nodes run the ports that make up our application and each pod uses persistent storage and that storage is delivered through a PVC persistent volume claim which maps to a persistent volume backed by EFS. EFS provides shared highly available storage that stretches across availability zones as we can see here 
and each zone has its own mount target so the pods can access the data with low latency. The most important part of this architecture is the EFS layer at the bottom. The EFS file system in the primary region replicates continuously to the EFS file system in the secondary region and this ensures that any file based data used by our pods stays in sync between the two regions. So whenever, whenever a failover happens, we do not need to manually copy anything. The secondary region already has the exact same pod layout, the same storage configuration and the same data. And this allows us to bring workloads online very quickly without complex manual steps. The next important step is then the automated back of flow for EBS, databases and application artifacts. The focus is on how we keep our backups consistent and ready for recovery. So I'll give example of exactly how we do. First, we automate EBS volume snapshots, capturing point in time images of our data volume so that they can be restored reliably. Second, we perform logical database backups with point in time recovery enabled. This gives us extremely fine control during restorations, especially for the transactional systems. Third, we replicate all application artifacts such as container images, configuration files to the secondary region so that the deployments do not fail due to the missing components. And finally, the automation engine performs the scheduled integrity checks which is also an important step because a backup that cannot be stored is, I'm oh, sorry, the, a backup that cannot be restored is essentially not a backup at all. So once a failover begins, the cluster in the secondary region must be ready to take over quickly. First, the EKS control plane is deployed automatically using infrastructure as code so that no manual steps are required. Second, the worker nodes are launched with the same capacity and configuration as production, so this ensures a smooth transition. Third, network policies and security rules are applied programmatically so that the cluster remains secure and compliant. Fourth, all essential add-ons such as monitoring, logging, or ingress controllers are installed automatically. And finally, automated validation tests confirm that everything is in correct state before any traffic is shifted, so that this gives us confidence that the environment is truly ready. Now, the traffic failover is one of the most user visible components. So it needs to work flawlessly. And Route 53 constantly checks the health of the primary endpoint. And once it identifies an issue, it updates DNS records to direct traffic to the healthy environment in the secondary region. And when we use a low TTL value, the DNS scenes Propagates quickly and users experience minimal disruption. System transitions control smoothly to the backup region, and all of these ties with automated failover workflows, ensuring that traffic shifts only after the second environment is fully prepared. Finally, this diagram brings together automation steps and the DNS failover logic. We have EKS cluster with auto scaling groups across our private subnets in both the regions and an application load balancer on the public subnet. The most important part here is the Route 53 application recovery controller. The re disaster recovery orchestration engine responds by provisioning or activating the secondary cluster, restoring data and validating the environment. And once everything is confirmed healthy, Route 53 updates the DNS routing so that all user requests go to the secondary cluster. This in whole creates a fully autonomous and highly reliable 
failover pipeline where every component walks together without requiring human intervention during critical moments. So this slide shows why infrastructure as code is essential for disaster recovery. So in this diagram, we can see how IIC eliminates configuration drift, which is one of the most common causes of failed recoveries. Infrastructure as code makes recovery predictable because all resources from VPCs to EKS node groups are defined in version control templates that can be recreated at any time. As we can see in this architecture diagram, at the bottom we have our foundational infrastructure modules, including VPC, subnet, security group, and routing components. Above that, the EKS cluster module defines the control plane and node groups. The automation engine connects to these modules, allowing us to deploy or recreate the cluster on demand. And at the top layer, application components and add-ons are deployed consistently through the same declarative approach. So in overall, this layered model ensures that every new environment is identical, whether it is created during normal operations or during a failover event. The most important component after ensuring all the traffic failover logic, IAC is actually having observability component. Observability plays a crucial role in ensuring that our multi-region recovery works smoothly. First, metrics collection through Prometheus enables us to visualize real-time health and performance of both clusters. Secondly, logs can be aggregated through applications like FluentD or CloudWatch, which helps us correlate events across regions whenever issue arise, and also having strong alerting mechanisms, notifying the right people the moment something looks unusual is also very important. So all in all, by maintaining consistent observability across primary and secondary regions, we can ensure that failover happens with full visibility rather than the blind automation. We've talked about complete cloud services, maintaining the disaster recovery, but one of the most important considerations when you're working in an organization is cutting the costs efficiently, also in the multi-region disaster recovery setups. Because it can be so expensive, so it's very important to optimize the costs intelligently. And the first step we could do is to store older backups in lower cost storage tires. And then scaling down the non-critical clusters during off-peak hours specifically to reduce compared costs and this is exactly what we had also done uh, in our application interfaces in the project that i'm working where we had also applied the nightly shutdown approach for scaling down the non-critical clusters third we can also design replication strategies that transfer only the data that is truly required avoid unnecessarily cross-region traffic and fourth is well-planned resource tracking which helps us track costs accurately and also identify unnecessary spend so finally continuous cost monitoring would help us strike a balance between resilience and of course budget So now we come to the final key takeaways from today's presentation. That is the visualization of complete end-to-end -end failover sequence. First, we detect the failover through automated health checks. Second, the disaster recovery orchestration engine initiates the failover workflow. Then we say the secondary cluster to be activated and configured. Fourth, backups are restored to ensure data integrity. 
Fifth, automated validation confirms that services are functioning correctly. And finally, Route 53 updates traffic routing so that users are redirected to the healthy secondary region. This entire chain of events works as a smooth automated process, allowing us to maintain continuity even during regional disruptions. And I like you all to take these as the key takeaways from this session whenever dealing with the automated disaster recovery pipeline, specifically for the Kubernetes workloads on AWS. Thank you very much for joining the session. Uh, I hope this walkthrough has given you a clear understanding of how to design a fully autonomous disaster recovery pipeline for Kubernetes on AWS. And if you'd like to dive deeper into any part of this architecture or discuss how to apply this in real production systems, please feel free to reach out to me during this event today and I'm happy to connect, share experiences, and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and see you in the event.